Hello, hello, can y'all see me now? Can you hear me? How's everyone doing tonight? I'm just gonna change my oh, lighting a little bit. I see some people watching, so hello, say hi. I'm just answering y'all's questions tonight, so I don't have um, anything to do uh, unless you ask me questions. <laughs> Hey, Jay. Hubbers Plus, yes. I did the thing again today where I forgot that I don't need to hear anyone um, and plugged my headphones in, but I remembered at least not to put them in. <laughs> I see some other people here. Feel free to say hi. I'm just checking. I asked my Patreon to submit questions ahead of time, so I'm checking to see if there are any questions there. If I can remember my password. <laughs> Hi, Tara. Hi, Andrea. Hello, AO. All right, I think now we're cooking with gas. Um, so, like I said, I'm just here to answer your questions, so feel free to um, go ahead and start asking questions while I try to remember my Patreon password. I think I got it this time. Oh, now I have to verify my phone as a device. This is a lot. And just to log in. Found it. Okay. It looks like no questions from Patreon. So feel free. There's a plane flying overhead. Feel free to drop any questions below and I'll start answering them. There's only a handful of you, so don't be shy. Go ahead. Um, Andrea said, I have a question. Nudging agents when the three months passes, with everything going on these days, is that too soon for some agents? So I wouldn't say that three months is necessarily standard. Um, that was probably someone's just, like, suggested timeline. Um, and I'm assuming that's just on a query, right? Um unless you're talking about a full, let me know. And um, so I would just take a look at what they've said, um, what, you know, it, take a look at Query Tracker and see how long it's taken them to respond to things based on what other people have gotten back um, and kind of adjust your timeline based on what you're seeing there. So my, my goal was kind of a month and then this um, past two weeks we had um, – I don't know if y'all saw or not, but at Matt is um, leaving the agency. And so I am looking at taking on some of his clients. And so I haven't been able to read queries hardly at all, like the last two weeks, because I've been focusing on that. So I've fallen a little bit behind, but I try to go for a month um, to six, six weeks. Uh, but yeah, just take a look at, at what their stuff says. Um, some of them will just say like, if you don't hear from me in two months, it's a no or whatever. And um, then you just like kind of take it. Oh, the agent website specifically says up to three months. Um, I mean, if their website says three months, it's on them to update it. So I feel like that's fine. If, if they're taking longer, they need to update their own website and say that it's, it's taking them longer. Okay, Jay said, what's your favorite and least favorite trope to represent? Um, so a lot of my favorite tropes are specifically in the romance space, um, but in young adult, they can be in the romance space as well. Um, 
<clears throat> so one of my favorites, excuse me, is Enemies to Lovers, of course. And um, I like a lot of them, to be honest. The only ones that I don't like <laughs> are any baby-related ones. So like secret baby, accidental pregnancy, that kind of stuff. I'm not, not a fan of that. Obviously, in YA, that's kind of like a different story than if you're talking about adult romance, but. <clears throat> okay. How would you react as an agent to a query for a fantasy written before the crisis in Ukraine, but inspired by East Slavic culture? I'm worried to query a book that I love. I don't want to be oblivious or insensitive to what's happening to real vulnerable people by sending out a book that while a fantasy was inspired by the countries that are in turmoil. I don't think it's a problem. I wouldn't, I mean, there may be some agents that would respond differently, but I, I don't think it's a problem mainly because, I mean, you, obviously you didn't just write it right now. Nobody writes a book that quickly. Um, and also we don't know where we're going to be by the time a book that you're querying might be published. So, I feel I feel like it's fine. I don't. Some agents might disagree with me, but um, then you know they they'll just decline, I guess. But I don't see <laughs> I don't see it as a problem. Jay said, "How many clients do you have, and what is your targeted sweet spot?" So a lot of people have been asking this question lately, and I just like I I. Not, not nothing against Jay, of course. I love you, Jay, but I don't like this question. Um, just because it's like the number doesn't mean anything because it what really matters is like the clients and how often they're writing books and how much attention they need and that kind of thing. Cause you may have clients, so I could say like I want 15 clients or whatever, whatever the number is. Um, but if those client, all those clients are writing like three, four books a year, that's a lot different than if all of those clients are writing like one book every three years. So the number isn't really important. I feel like, um, I know agents have like what they call inactive clients. Um, so the number is weird, but I currently have, I say that I have two clients. It's three people though. So one is a pair of co-authors but it feels like two clients, at least at this point, because they haven't written any solo titles. Um, but I am looking at taking on um, maybe six, five or six of Matt's clients, which uh, is a lot. Um, so to take on at once anyway, but they are themselves in different areas, different parts of the careers, right? So like one of them is in the middle of like a three book deal. So she's not going to need a lot of attention for a while. Um, where some are like about ready to go on submission. So they're going to need a lot of work. Some of them have books that need edited. So they're going to need a lot of work. So it differs. Um, but I currently have, as of this moment, three people for two different books. Are vampires still a marketable thing, especially in YA? So vampires, I feel like they're kind of coming back. Um I just finished reading um, The Lost Girls by Sonia Hartle, which I really enjoyed and did really well. And um, The Coldest Touch by Isabel Sterling. I finished that, I think, at the end of last year. Um, and I th so I, I think they, they are sellable, but also you need to do something a little bit different with them. So if you're, you're doing kind of the same stories that came out in the early aughts or whenever it was that that was happening... Um, that's not going to sell, but you'd, if you're doing something different with them, something a little more interesting, yeah, I think it can sell. Okay, AOS, if an agent's querying process doesn't require any sample pages up front, and then the agent requests a printed printed 50 pages with an SASE, is this a red flag? It is, a, is it a concern of them being outdated if an agent requests print? <clears throat> I don't want to say there's a red flag because there could be valid reasons for this that I'm not aware of, but it is weird. Um, it is out of the norm. I would take a look at PM and see if they're still selling books. Because, I mean, honestly, if they're still selling books, especially if they're still selling debuts, then, like, maybe they just, I don't know, maybe they need print for some reason. But it is weird. I do think it is weird. Um, and it is a little outdated, but... 
not, uh, I, to be honest, I wouldn't query someone who did this just because I need my communication primarily through email. Um, so that's a consideration for you. If you need primarily email communication, um, this might not be the person for you because this is a, some, this is a sign that they're going to want kind of older forms of communication. So they might want to talk on the phone, for example, versus email. Um, but yeah, I, I don't like it personally, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. Uh, Jay asks, a friend of mine has an agent is an on submission. Editors say they love it, but not enough to buy. How would you handle this situation? This happens a lot. This is actually happening to me right now. Uh, I mean, this is what happens. Like, honestly, most of the time on submission, um, you, you get a lot of, a lot of responses that are like, I love this. I love this part of it. I love this part of it, but it doesn't X, Y, Z. Um, you know, it doesn't have enough whatever it is like that they're looking for. So for example, the book that my agent is putting on submission, uh, we got a note that it was a little bit quiet for the market, which honestly I kind of agree with, but it also that's what that story is. Um, so basically you just try to find the editors and give the book the best chance that it has. Um, but in the meanwhile, the writer should be working on something new because just because you can't sell a book, um, doesn't mean that it's like automatic, that it's going to be dead forever. Right. So, um, on my podcast queries, qualms and quirks, I interview published authors about their journey to publication. And if you go back and listen to Mike Chen's episode, um, he had a book that they were not able to sell. And then after he sold a couple other books, he was able to, um, kind of I think they rewrote the pitch or whatever, and then they sold that book. So just because a book doesn't sell now, it doesn't mean it's never going to sell. Um, but yeah, you just have to do it. And, and so I will say like after the first round of submissions and we saw some of the things editors were saying, um, Rebecca came back to me and was like, do you want to make any edits based on these, this feedback? And the primary feedback from one was like, it's too quiet for the market, which I'm like, yeah, it's, that's just the book that it is right now. Um, and then the other two pieces of major feedback were directly on conflict with each other. <laughs> so it wasn't like we were getting like the same stuff back. Right. Um, and so I was just like, no, I like, I, I'm happy with the book the way it is. And that was a conversation that we had. And so that's a conversation obviously that I would have with a writer. Kelly said, is it frowned upon as a disabled writer seeking the representation of an agent who is searching to amplify disabled voices that my protagonist is not disabled? Um, I, it's not frowned upon. Um, but so like if, it, if an agent is saying that they're wanting to amplify disabled voices, then they're probably also wanting to amplify disabled stories. Um so I, I, it's not frowned upon. It just may not be exactly what they mean by that, but that doesn't, it also doesn't mean it's a no. Right. Um, so you say no to books for very many reasons and that wouldn't be one that someone would just like say no for that reason. The lighting is changing in here because someone is turning off lights. <laughs> okay. Rob said, I'm ready to query YA. That begins with the death of the main character's best friend. Main, ter main character goes through a shock grieving process, but the book moves into romance and ends joyfully. How do I query without scaring agents? I would just make it very clear in the in the query that this the MC does um, you know heal through their grieving process, and that it does end joyfully because. I know particularly a lot of editors right now are just not looking for the super sad books right now. Um, and so I think most editors are looking for books with at least some kind of hope. Um, and yeah, so I would just make it clear that, uh, you know, at your, your main character goes through the grieving process and, um, And then that there is like a hopeful note at the end. Wow. 
Andrea said, how many rejections before you pull the book and start querying something else? Um, honestly, if, if you are confident in the book, meaning like you have had beta edit, beta readers that you trust, critique partners that you cr trust, and you're, you're getting personalized feedback saying that your writing is good or whatever, um, but there's just like some element that's not right, um, then I would try, I would at that point try to query everyone that I was interested in working with. Um, and once you've exhausted that list, that's it. Then you, then you start querying something else. Um, but if you're getting no personalized feedback and you're not entirely confident in the quality of the book, um, you may want to take a hard look at it after maybe like 15, I mean, depending on the genre, cause like, um, there are obviously a lot more agents that represent young adult fiction, for example, versus agents who represent cozy mysteries, for example. So um, I would say like, you know, if you've, if you've queried a good solid, like 10 to 20% of the agents who represent your stuff and have received no personalized feedback or anything, um, then that may warrant a uh, revision on the book or a rewrite of your query letter. And it's really hard to answer this question without knowing, you know, reading the book and that kind of thing. But I think that you should give every book the, every chance that it could have, but then um, move on to the next one. Because again, just because a book dies on submission or dies on querying doesn't mean it's dead forever. Jay asked, do your clients connect, get to connect with each other in a special Slack channel or anything like that? Something to create community within your clients or are they each on their own islands? I don't currently have anything like that mainly because I don't have that many clients. And so I don't think it would be very, <laughs> I think it would be very quiet. Um, especially because two of my three clients are just not online very much. They're not online, always online kind of people. Um, maybe in the future, but not currently. I don't have anything like that. For contemporary YA, when do you think the inciting incident needs to happen? First five pages, first 10 pages. Seem like agents want it ASAP right now. Um, I mean, it's hard. It's hard to, to answer that question because it honestly, like everything is like, it depends, <laughs> right? Um, so let me look at real quick. Thing, but um, and I don't think it necessarily has to have a client. Uh, um, my computer just froze one second. I don't think it necessarily has to have an exciting incident in the first five or 10 pages, but um, it something does need to happen in the first five or 10 pages. Um, I've definitely seen books where it's just like the person is like going about their normal life and there's no tension at all. Um, there's nothing, absolutely nothing interesting happening. And I understand the writer is trying to show like this is their normal life before things change. But you really, you really need to have at least some sort of tension, even if it's not necessarily um, the main, you know, tension of the book. So, I mean, first first ten pages is nice if you can, but sometimes you need a little bit of setup to get to that point. Um, I don't know if that answered your question, but yeah, <laughs> I hate like uh, questions all the time. I'm like, it depends. Everything is like, I, it depends. It depends. It depends. But it's true. It really does depend on the story and the book and how well it's written. And some people can take something that's kind of mundane, not a lot happening and write it so well that you can't stop reading anyway. Um, but uh, that I feel like that talent is pretty rare. Um Okay, so Kelly was rephrasing. I don't say outright that she is no divergent, but she is. Okay. Um, okay. 
I mean, is there is there a reason why you're not stating that she's neurodivergent in the query? Oh, these are my significant others. Kelly likes your Patrick Nagel prints. Thank you. <laughs> he said thanks. Uh, Kendra asks, I've heard different opinions on this and I find it so confusing, but how many queries do you recommend sending? A few at a time, one at a time, and how many in total? So again, that's going to depend on how many agents are that represent your book. I always do it as kind of like a proportion of that. Um, I, I mean, I would, if I was querying these days, I would send 10 to 15 at first. I also write young adult, by the way. So one of the largest categories, um, I would query maybe 10 to 15 and just see what kind of response I'm getting those 10 to 15. And this is just, again, personally what I would do those 10, 15, I would do a mix of kind of like my top tier agents and some of the, um, agents that I, I am interested in, but maybe don't know a lot about, or I'm not completely sure about. Um, so that, if it turns out that my query is just a disaster and I don't realize it, or my opening pages are just a disaster, I don't realize it. I haven't wasted the chance on every agent that I want to work with. That's the reason why you kind of do it in rounds. Um, submissions is kind of the same way, um, except that we can only sum submit to like certain houses, uh, one, and there are a lot fewer <laughs> options than there are agents. But um one thing that I've seen that seems kind of cool to me and seems like it might be a good idea is to do kind of rolling submissions. And so when you get a couple of rejections and a couple more out, especially if you're getting personalized feedback or you're just like really confident in the project. Um, sometimes like when you're submitting a story, you know that it's good, but you also know that the market is tough for it. And that's, you know, obviously that's going to be treated differently than if you don't know if the book is good or not. All right. Oh, someone else likes your art too. <laughs> okay. Steven said, um, for new authors, I hear the first book needs to be less than hundred K sci-fi adult. Is that true? I've heard maybe less than 120 K is feasible too. Um, yeah. So for adult, I mean, a lot of people say 100 K, but a lot of adult sci-fi agents won't blink at 120. If it seems like the plot can support it, of course. Um, if, if it gets above 100k it's like you really need to prove pretty quickly like that this is going to be worth my time um, and so just keep that in mind so like nothing is like a hard well I won't say nothing I got a romance the other day that was like 300,000 words and so that was a pretty hard pass but um, very few things are like a hard hard pass um, they're just like little things that kind of add up so let's say you're querying uh, a genre that's kind of out of style, then everything else just needs to be that much better. You're, you're querying a 130K sci-fi adult. Everything needs to be like on, on, you know, on, what's the word? Uh, everything needs to be like really, really good is what I'm saying. Um, so just keep that in mind. For young adult, as a debut, I would not go above 100k hard stop um with very very few exceptions many books nowadays begin with content warnings should my manuscript include this my query or both i think it's a good idea to include it in your query um i ask so i have a submission form and i ask for content warnings on my query on my form and, and i specifically list two of my uh, the, the, the content that I have maybe the biggest issues with. Um, and so I do think it's a good idea to include it in, in your query, even if it's just at the end, you know, um, and I would put it at the end, like once they've got past everything else, because if, if they don't need content warnings then they can just skip over that information, but if they do need content warnings, they're definitely going to appreciate it. If they don't need content warnings, they're not going to hold it against you, of course. So, um, yeah, definitely, definitely include that, especially if they ask for it, because a lot of times they'll the agents will specifically ask for it. 
Uh, and you can even break it down by like what's in the sample that you've submitted versus what's in the rest of the manuscript. And the, I see a lot of writers doing that. And that's pretty cool. Um, because I know that like reading the sample, I'm not going to have to worry about it. But if I request the full, then I'll have to make sure I'm just in a good headspace to read what it is. And so I do want to talk about content warnings a little bit because we're talking about it. Um, a content warning doesn't mean like, especially if I ask for a specific type of content warning, it doesn't mean that I'm not going to read the book if it has that information in it, if it has that content in it. It just means that um, I need to make sure that I am a good headspace to read that info. So if I'm having like a really bad mental health day, I'm just going to put it off until like the next day or two days from now. Um, and so then that, that's what content warning says. It doesn't mean that I reject the query or, or auto automatically reject the query or anything. Um, but it, so if I have that on my no list, that's a different story versus like the content warnings I'm asking for. It means I'm still going to read it. I just need to make sure I'm aware of it before it happens versus if it's on my no list, it means like, do not send it to me. That is an automatic reject. Um, Julian said, I'm querying for adult science fiction, uh, subgenre science fantasy. Is there much market for this right now? Seems like there are many more YA science fiction agents. So the YA science fiction market isn't very good, actually. There may be a lot of agents taking it, but it has to be just like 100% like top tier. Um, I don't, I don't think, I don't think that major publishers are doing a great job of marketing young adult science fiction. And then those books don't do well. And then they use the proof that those books didn't do well to sell. I mean, to say that it doesn't sell. Um, but anyway, back to your question. Sorry, <laughs> I went on a little side note there. Uh, there is a market for it. It's it's very small market. There are very few editors that you can submit to in adult science fiction. Um, and for that reason, it's very competitive. Um, so yeah, there's a market for it. It's just, I mean, nothing's an easy sale, really. Um, but you just have to keep in mind how relatively small the market is. And so it really needs to be something kind of fresh and exciting. Um, something that's easy to pitch helps. Calson, how would you interpret two different agents? Take on my first chapters. One said too much exposition and the other said not enough. Neither gave clarification. That just means those um, agents have different tastes. It happens all the time. Um, readers have different tastes. I know that you can like, um, like imagine like a book that you read and then someone else has read the same book and you have very different opinions on it. Agents are the same way. Agents on our monolith. So um, I know that for me, I, even though I take adult science fiction and fantasy, my tastes are very much like in the young adult sphere and has been shaped by the young adult sphere. So I am less tolerant of exposition than an agent who maybe only works in like a high fantasy, right? Because they, they're just going to read a lot more of it and they're going to be a lot more tolerant of it. So it just, it totally depends. It just, it's just a difference of opinion. I wouldn't try to, I wouldn't read too much into it. I remember I got two rejections one day when I was querying on the same day. One said that um, they loved the characters, but they um, didn't like the plot. They didn't think it had a, a solid plot. And the other one said that they loved the plot and the concept but they didn't really like the characters. And that's, it's just like a difference of opinion. There's not much you can do there. Um, are you an editorial agent? To what extent would you do bigger edits for a story you love or only small? So I'm, I'm moderately editorial. Um, I'm not hugely editorial. I, um, I said this for pitch wars for a long time too. It's kind of the same thing. So in pitch wars, my, I think it was because I started as a publicist. My expertise would be, in taking a book that was already very well written and just making tweaks and making adjustments to make it more sellable, um, especially in the young adult space, and that I think that's what I'm the best at. I'm also really good at pacing, fixing pacing issues and fixing, not fixing, but improving pacing issues and improving um, character development. And so um, sometimes it's like, I know that this book needs this kind of edits, but I'm not the kind of person to lead a person in that kind of edits, especially this would be especially in pitch wars. Um, so I, I'm usually not going to take on a book that needs a major overhaul. With that being said, 
I have taken on a book that needed a major overhaul because I loved it that much. So there's exceptions to everything. Uh, I think we just, we already talked about inciting incident. So I'm going to skip that question. What are the pros and cons of large big name agencies versus small ones? Same questions for publishers. Um, I mean, it, it depends. <laughs> I'm just going to answer every question. It depends and move on. Um, no, it really does depend. It depends on the agent too. Um, so big name agencies, um, sometimes they can have the advantage of having specialists. So they may have in-house specialists for certain things. So people who do contracts, people who do um, foreign rights, people who do audiobook rights. Some agencies may have a person who is specifically focused on audiobook rights, whereas some smaller agencies, the agent will also be doing the audiobook rights, though some smaller agencies do have those people. So, for example, Tobias, we're a pretty small agency, but we have a full-time foreign rights agent. We have um, several people who work in TV and film. So um, it's it's not, you know... I, it's not an absolute, of course. And then also I would say like some bigger name agencies are able to pay their agency's salaries. And sometimes that does mean that a newer agent has a more a bigger chance of being able to stick around. Um, but then on the flip side, like a lot of smaller agents allow for remote work. So not living in New York City. So you're more able to survive on a smaller salary or, um, you know, no salary, which is what most agents get when they first start out. So I can say, for example, there are some agencies where they would maybe give you a salary of like 40000 as a new agent, but you would have to move to New York City. So in New York City, to have the same standard of living, um, well, let's say, let's do it the other way around. So a 40, making forty k in New York City to have the same sort of standard of living where I live, it's literally double. So I would have to make 80000 to have the same standard of living. I'm sorry. Flip that and reverse it. I would only have to make 20000 on Orlando to um, to have the same standard of living. And so that's something that someone may be able to do in a part-time basis, right? And so even though they're paying a salary, the agent may be more financially stable not having a salary if they don't have to live in New York City. I hope I explained that. Well, I got a little lost in the middle there. Rob asked, as an agent, if you don't recognize a comp title in a query, do you Google it? Not usually. Um, comp titles are, I mean, like, as long as there's a description of what the story is, I don't really need comp titles, even though sometimes they do help place the story. So no, I probably wouldn't. Uh, any steps for portraying emotionally damaged characters without them seeming weak or uninteresting? I often find myself forcing agency but wanted to still feel real and raw. Um, what I would do is like, I, I feel like people are, are emotionally damaged. They're not completely damaged in all aspects. And so they're strong in some aspects, right? And so I would just make sure that I am doing that. I don't know why Julian is saying that. Oh, um, sorry. That was a, a little while ago. How important do you think comps are? What if a query had none, for example? Uh, I mean, comps can help, but I don't think they're mandatory. I don't think they're needed. Um, but sometimes they can be really helpful for quickly figuring out exactly what a book is going to be, what it's going to feel like. That, to me, is what a comp is. It's like what the book is going to feel like. Um, some people I think get too bogged down on like trying to match plot elements in comps. And that's, that's not really, I mean, sometimes that can help, but like, it's really not, um, the main purpose of a comp for me. So I, if they don't have any, it's not a huge deal, but the query letter then needs to make sure it, it's quite spot on. All right. And I'll ask, if you get a rejection from an agent, can you ever query them again on the same manuscript? Only if you have made a significant revision. Um, 
And so if if you're querying again and the query letter reads the same and the first page reads the same, then no, uh, don't don't requery them. But um, if you made a significant re revision, then yes. Okay, Jay asked if you you keep mentioning audiobook rights in the current queue. I really want an audiobook when I get published. Do writers have any say in this? No. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so most major publishers at this point, especially in YA, are claiming audiobook rights. So then it's kind of up to the publisher. And a lot of major publishers will not uh, will not offer a contract without audiobook rights included. Like it's a it's a hard stop for them. Um, so at that point, it's kind of like up to the publisher what happens. Um, smaller publishers, sometimes you can keep the audiobook rights um, in different genres. So like some adult genres, it's a lot easier to keep the audiobook rights. And in that case, you have a little bit of say in that you can ask your agent, encourage your agent to submit to places that publish audiobooks that other publishers have published. And there are a couple of those. Um and so not really is the answer. Um, but so, for example, my book, Keeping Our Secret, got published in 2016, I believe. And I just found out like two months ago that um, we sold the audiobook rights to Tantor Media, which is probably the biggest company that that makes audiobooks of other publishers' books. Um, so sometimes it can happen. Jay said, if I'm querying an agent who has previously requested a full on an old manuscript, should I mention that history? Like, you liked me before, check it out now. Uh, you can. If they have said something like, you know, this concept really isn't working for me, but I really like your writing. I I specifically say in some of my rejections, like, I really you, you're a good writer. I clearly like your writing, but this concept just isn't working for me or something like that. Um, and then I'll say... If you find yourself querying anything else, I would be happy to take a look. And if I have said that, and if an agent has said something like that, I would definitely mention it in the query letter. All right. We have about eight minutes left, by the way. So I'm trying to max this out at 40, 45 minutes. So just a heads up. But if we run out of questions before that, then we'll just stop. Julian said, what really gets your attention in a query letter? So, um... I mean, there, there are a lot of things. I think if it's obvious that someone has taken the time to learn what a query letter looks like, that that is helpful. Because to me, it's a signal that they have taken the time to make sure that their writing is in shape. It's not necessarily always true. Sometimes writers are just clueless about what a query letter is and, and fantastic book writers. But um, it does help with, you know, the professionalism aspect. I, I do get queries that frequently do not resemble what a query letter should look like under, you know, any guidelines. So there's that. Um, that I mean, that's just like a basic, right? Uh, and then I, I mean, conflict and stakes are the two big things that should be in your query letter. What is the conflict of your story? And what happens if that conflict ends badly? What are the conflict and stakes? Sometimes those can be big, like, world-ending stuff, which honestly to me is less interesting. Um, sometimes it can be really close personal stuff. Sometimes it can be internal stuff. Sometimes it's not even external conflict and stakes. Uh, and then another thing that I really like to see in query letter is just what makes this book different from a lot of other books that are like it. So, for example, if you're writing a book that is very, very similar to Red Queen, which is common, a lot of people are writing books like that, um, what is it about your book that, that makes it different than Red Queen? What makes it stand out? Uh, so th those are the big three. Um, make sure it looks like a query letter, conflict and stakes, and um, something. What What's unique about your book? What's different about your book from every other book on the shelf? AO asked, how important is it for writers to be part of organizations like SC, BWI, or RWA if they don't have any other accolades? I always say, and I almost every chat I've ever done, you'll hear me say this, the book is the thing. The book is the most important thing. Being a member of SWWI or being a, or even being a award-winning author in another category, um, if I don't like the book, it's not going to change my mind. 
Um, and if I if I do like the book and you don't have any accolades or memberships, that's not going to change my mind. So the book is the most important thing. Sometimes, especially if, if it's a big thing, like someone has is a New York Times bestselling author, for example, I am going to take a little bit of a closer look and might give it a little more leeway than I might otherwise. But being like things like being a member of SCBWI and RWA, um, I mean, they're nice, but they're they're not going to make change my decision on a book. Oh, I saw, I didn't switch this question on the screen. Sorry about that. Should you include a prologue with your sample pages if it's not focused directly on your main character? It doesn't become relevant until the later chapters of the book. So I mentioned this in a, a the last video chat, and it, it caused some some drama. But um, the main problem with prologues in submissions is your query is about a character and the the conflict and the whatever that they're going through. Oftentimes the prologue is about a different character and it seems like it's part of a different story. And so it's hard to see how the query letter connects with the pages, especially because often, especially if it's clear that we're not enjoying the story, we're only reading maybe the first page. Um, and so that that is the trouble, that is the risk that you take when you include a prologue with your sample pages. Um, if it is not necessary, if the prologue is not necessary to understand the first page of chapter one, I would probably exclude it because I want to know what it's going to be like to spend most of the book with that point of view character, which does not happen if that first paragraph, first page is from the prologue. It's not the character I'm going to be spending the most of the book with, so it's harder for me to make a decision. Jay asked, would you represent someone who is on Team T? Would that strain your relationship with them? What if they hit coffee in any form? Yes, I would represent someone on Team T. One of my best friends is strongly Team T. You all know her if you've been on my channel before. Um, would that strain your relations with them? Sometimes it does, to be honest, Bess. Because she gets mad. But as long as you don't get mad, that's fine. Um, what if, what if they hate coffee in any form? Any coffee shop has tea at it. So it's fine. That's fine. Okay. If you could have been the one to wrap any published book or author in history, what, who would you choose? Oh man, that's a good question. Um, oh, like, I feel like I could just list a whole bunch of people, but like, uh, well, also, because I don't I don't know what they look like before the agent got them. So, like, it's, sometimes it's hard to say that because, like, sometimes the magic happens in the editorial process. Um, it, uh, sorry, I'm going to jump to Andrea's comment. So, Andrea said, I have included a prologue. This is very helpful. Thank you. So, I asked for three chapters. So, oftentimes what I'll do if I'm not connecting with the prologue is I'll skip and read the first chapter anyway. So, it's fine. If you if you have queried me included in a prologue, don't worry about it. I'll probably just read the first chapter anyway. Um, okay, so back to Jay's question, which is a hard question. I mean, there's like, oh. I maybe we were liars by E.K. Lockhart. Um, mainly because I feel like that honestly just changed the YA category so much. It was such a formative book for the modern YA category. Um, and in the same vein, Sadie, like Sadie kind of did the same thing. Sadie brought mainstream thrillers or thrillers to the mainstream YA market. Um, so I think, I think those kind of books that kind of like changed the game for the genre and category that they're in. Oh, getting in the ninth. Um, this is how you lose the time war. Same kind of concept where they kind of like just changed a lot of the genre. <laughs> Jay's just asking you about pub talk live questions. Um, we have, we have just a minute left. So uh, my favorite snack that I cannot eat is Cheez-Its because of soy. I can have small amounts. I really, really like Kalamata olives. That's one of my favorite snacks. 
All right. I think that's all the questions. <laughs> all the serious questions, <laughs> Jay. Um, yeah. So that's that's the time for today. Um, so I schedule. I'm gonna try to schedule these maybe like once a month, something like that. Um, so just keep an eye out either on YouTube or on Twitter. Um, and and we'll we'll keep doing these. I also um if it works better for you, I syndicate them on the Pub Talk Live uh podcast channel. I'm not using Pub Talk Live and Agent Chat Live anymore. So um I'm just gonna I have it, it's there, so I'm just gonna use it to syndicate the audio from these on there, even though it's a much more casual chat, not necessarily podcast format, but um and Jay said, everyone, don't forget to like the video. Thank you, Jay. Uh, and thank you, everyone. And if you haven't checked out Queries, Clums, and Quirks, my podcast, I have a whole bunch of authors telling their journeys to publication. I think it's really helpful to see that other authors have struggled with the similar things that you have struggled with and come out successful on the other side of them. And um, I think it can be really heartening, even though like some of the stories are, you know, like Suzanne Parks, I she... Went, went to acquisition, acquisitions like five times before she finally sold a book. And that's just, she got like a thousand rejections before she sold a book. And that's hard. Um, but I think it's it's kind of heartening to see that someone has gone through that and uh, ended up, you know, successful. Uh, yeah, so that, the typewriter is also a significant others. <laughs> um, so obviously I'm at his house. So there's a Another one there. And there's actually, let's see if we can get, there's a children's typewriter right there behind me. So uh, it's tiny and cute. Um, yeah. And then on Wednesdays, we do write-ins. Feel free to join those. Um, come hang out with us. So we we set a timer for 20 minutes and write, and then we chat for 10 minutes. And we do that three times. So it's a nice place because you get some write done, but you also get a little bit of community as well. And uh, it's a lot of fun. So all right. I think that's it. Everyone stay safe, wash your hands, wear a mask, and hopefully we'll see you next time. Bye, y'all.